All right, guys, so this video is going to be a little bit different. This is not at all related to typology or any of the stuff that I usually talk about. Uh, this is more into the more like inspiration and business sort of sphere. If you're not interested in that, if you you don't want to, if you're here just for the typology, then this video is not for you. I still think you might actually benefit something from this video. Okay, so this is going to be an interesting one. Uh, I was having a go at reading this book. All right, let's see if you can take a look. Marketing a Strategy by Nirmalia Kumar. And there is a really interesting case study about um, Sunny, which I want to share with you guys, which is basically, yeah. Now, I'm going to get into more like the business aspects and give you some context of what's going on. But I want you guys to focus mainly on the, pl the people, all right, the individuals I'm going to mention here and the thing that they go through, all right, because it's pretty fucking dope. So, yeah, I might be recording more videos like this in the future, but yeah. And anyway, just to let you guys know, I do have a script, some notes that I took. That I'm going to be reading off of. So my bad for not being able to memorize everything and just spit it out. I kind of wrote this pretty quick, right? So yeah. All right. So Sony was trying to drive the market in a new direction. Uh, their strategy in doing so was to create an environment where they allowed uh, mistakes and experimentation. They were trying to come up with the next new product or innovation to drive their market in a completely different direction to completely dominate the market there. So in the year 1980, they created three teams across two different departments uh, to work on improving the conventional floppy disk, which at the time was at 5.25 inches in terms of size. All right. So three teams, all right, three teams. Team one envisioned that the disk would be more compact. The second team envisioned reducing the size from 5.25 to 3.5 inches. Now, 3.5 inches, that later eventually became the standard size for floppy disks. And then the third team envisioned a 2-inch floppy disk with a higher rotation speed, all right? Now, there are two people to focus on, which is uh, the leader of Team 1, a, a guy named Kamoto, and the leader of Team... I'm sorry, no, the leader of Team 2, a guy named Komoto and the leader of team three, a guy named Ken Kutoragi. All right. So they're both Japanese. Three months pass and team one completely fails. All right. Team one, they, they, they face a bunch of technical issues. Three months later, they completely flop. All right. No, no pun intended. Now, team two, the one that's led by Komoto. All right. They made progress after three months. They build a prototype after three months and unveiled it in 1981 and which piqued the interest of Apple. Fast forward two years later, in 1983, Steve Jobs adopts the new disc and implements it for his new Macintosh. All right. Uh, and in case I got to explain what a floppy disk is, because I know like it's, it's ancient technology at this point, but basically a floppy disk is something you use to store. It's like a, a memory stick. That's the old way of storing uh, data. All right, there were no USB sticks back then. All right, so Steve Jobs, 1983, adopts the floppy disk, integrates it into his Macintosh, and he asks Sony to improve the prototype, and that, that actually ended up happening. The prototype ended up improving. They started adding new features to their prototype, such as automatic deject and inject, uh, lower prices, and just overall better performance. All right, they decreased the price by 50%. However, despite that, it was only um, adopted by Apple and another company called Hewlett Packard. All right, but it was ignored by IBM. Uh, we, IBM is a pretty big company, all right, but we don't need to get into IBM now. So, Komodo in the year 1987 was uh, brought on to the marketing team of, of Sony and, became, and, so, and the uh, floppy disk then became the new standard. All right, it became the new, it replaced the 5.25 inch size. Now, the 3.5 inch version is now the new standard. All right. Now, now here's what's interesting. Now, here's where things start to get interesting because Komoto, now he, he's experiencing massive success. All right. He's doing really good in his career. He, the, the, he, his, his design, his, his piece of tech, his advancement, improvement now became the standard within the entire industry. Now, this is a big deal. I mean, uh, Steve Jobs literally adopts it and uses it for his release in the Macintosh. That's a big win for um, Komoto. Now, in the year 1991, uh, he was brought on to improve other internal components of Sony's computers, right? But all of that failed, all right? All of those attempts, actually, they just 
failed. Yeah, I'm not going to say flopped again. <laughs> it's all right. Now, at that point, Komodo thought that his career was over. All right. He thought his career was done. It was finished. He was put in charge of, uh, of, of uh, this new project of improving the components within the computer. But it all failed. And yeah, at that point, he thought his career was finished. But what's interesting is Sony didn't actually give up on him. They were like, yo, listen, you, you helped us out in the past. You were able to, you had a, a good track record. This is one L for you. But uh, here's a third project. Let's go on to do the third project. Uh, Komodo picked his ass back up and then went, did, um, what was it called? Yeah, now he was in charge of improving the magnetic tape. All right. Uh, so what happened was this was a huge success. So Komodo got another W, another win, which was he ended up helping and Sonny got another win for believing in him because what ended up actually happening was that Sonny increased their market share from three to 25%. All right. So the moral of the story is that you're sometimes going to experience success and then you're going to experience a setback, right? But then what really calls into question, like, what type of person are you? What's your character? Is the ability for you to come back from the setback, right? How can you bounce back? And he bounced back. And because Sonny believed in him, that's an another thing that I'm thinking is, it's really important to have people around you that actually believe in you, right? Even, even when you're covered in shit, because they know, okay, life is all about the peaks and the troughs, the ups and downs, right? Right now, you're experiencing a down period before you are an up, all right? We know you're going to go back up again, so just go back up again. So again, Sonny believed in him, and he believed in himself, and then he made a comeback, and then succeeded, and then increased the market share from 3 to 25%. All right, now that's the leader of Team 2, uh, Komodo. Now, if you think that's an interesting story, now wait till you hear this one, all right? Wait till you hear Ken Kutaragi and what he had to go through. All right, because this part is pretty dope. All right, so the third team, they initially envisioned, all right, they set out to reduce the size of the floppy disk from 5.25 inches to 2 inches. All right, and to increase the uh, rotation speed. Now, the progress is that they actually developed a two-inch disc, but other components needed to be changed drastically, all right, for it to actually integrate the, the, the much smaller floppy disk. So what happened was um, they couldn't really do this. So what Sony decided to do is that they decided to have their own laptop, all right, they created their own laptop that integrated this new two-inch size disc, um, it's a laptop called Produce, all right? Now, that laptop, it was meant to be like the uh, platform to achieve success for the floppy disk itself, right? Because it was specifically designed to accommodate for the small size. That laptop failed, all right? It failed, didn't work. So then they try again, the two-inch floppy disk. They try that again. And this time, instead, instead of a laptop, they try to use it on a camera. Now, on the camera, again, same thing, failed. All right, so that's two L's, all right? They failed twice in a row. Now, now Kutaragi, after those two failures, he was persistent. He was like, nope, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep pushing this forward and keep going at it, all right? So what, what he did was he approached Nintendo, to integrate the disc in their gaming console, all right? They agreed. Nintendo agreed. They, they even signed the contract. But after three years, all right, get this. So this is where it gets really crazy, in my opinion. After three years, um, they terminated the contract. They ended the contract. And they never even released the gaming console with his uh, floppy disc, all right? So just like that, three years of his time, of constantly talking with them, meeting with them, communicating with them ideas and working on it and all that, three years gone in the dumpster, trash. Not really. Because see, here's, here's what's here. What happened next is pretty sick. So after this failure, he goes and he asks Sonny to develop their own console. And he convinced them that the three years that he spent with Nintendo has taught him a lot in the gaming industry. And that everything that he learned from the gaming industry for during those three years, he can now integrate it into this new gaming console, which he's asking Sony to do. And instead of you running it on, um, and he asked him to run it on a, on a CD, All right, The game's going to run on a CD. 
So in the year 1994, Sony creates PlayStation. All right. Now, I, I, you already know what PlayStation is. They've created PlayStation in the year 1994. And then they went on to control 70% of the, of the market share of gaming industries. All right. Let that sink in for a second. The dude didn't just take one L or two L's. He took three L's. All right. He lost three times. Three years of his time completely gone. Not really gone because he learned from it. And that's kind of the moral of the story is that if you have to start over after years of putting in work towards something, you're not really starting over. You're starting something new with the previous experiences you've actually had and the better insights that you'll have because of the time that you put in. All right. Naturally, you're going to go a little bit smarter. You're going to be have, a, have a, a keener sense of awareness. So what happened was that because of that, despite the L's, because he continued to keep plowing through, right? He didn't really give a shit. He, he took one L, dust, got back up, dusted himself off and kept going and took another and then another, which is pretty fucking dope. That turned into PlayStation and PlayStation now at that point in time, uh, not, not at that point in time, but a few years later, makes one third of all of Sony's uh, profits. All right. So PlayStation generates one third of their profits. So one third of Sony's business came from. All right. It came from a Kutaragi and his persistence to never give up despite failures over and over and over again. All right. So that's really basically the moral of the story here. That's literally the moral of the story. All right. So um, I forgot to actually mention something. All right. Which is another important lesson uh, to be drawn from the uh, Sunny case, which is that what was initially a tangential uh, project ended up making one third of Sunny's uh, revenue. And I think this is actually a really interesting, you could say, lesson or law. I wouldn't even call it a law. I'm not even sure if that qualifies as a law, but it's very interesting to know because oftentimes the things that are in the periphery of your vision, all right, the things that you're not really focusing or paying too much attention on, they end up being the thing that give you the most success and actually end up shifting and turning into the main center of focus of what you're trying to do, right? Like, for example, in my case, right? And I look, I, I know this is true because of this case that I, that I found myself in. So if any, so during, uni, so during, when I was in university, right? I was doing uni full time, but I was also doing like a music, uh, chasing after music production and trying to build a brand as a music producer full time. Um, I was doing quite a lot of things. I also volunteered working in construction, which was a bad idea, <laughs> which was a fucking terrible idea. I tried working at a, at a, a restaurant as well. Just, just doing a bunch of shit, right? Just trying a few things here and there. And most of them really weren't going to cut it for me. But then the stuff that I was doing in music, that was, oh, it was all right. Like I was making a couple books here and stuff like that, making money, selling beats and all that. However, so here's where, where, where it gets interesting. During the time that I was in uni, all right, I was doing full-time music production and then marketing myself as a music producer online digital marketing and all that now by the time i actually graduated right you keep, keep this in mind my main goals were one music and two uh university well, although university didn't really turn to a main goal until like after the first two years or something then, then i started to actually focus on it the point being is that the marketing that i was doing for my music i actually just saw it as a means to an end like i was just like ah oh, whatever this is what I got to do. It's just a means to an end. And it's like, I really didn't pay too much attention. I mean, I put my effort, I put like effort and focus into it. And I was always trying to learn and grow in that area. But I was really doing it as a means to an end instead of an end of itself. All right. It was on the periphery of my vision, you could say. So what actually ended up happening was is that by the time I graduated, I didn't know this until after I graduated, but all these years that I was doing university, marketing myself in music producer as well, 
they all actually counted as real life marketing experience because I could actually put that all into my portfolio. So I actually ended up being able to graduate with already four years of experience. And that sort of like put me ahead of where I was supposed to be in terms of my age group by a couple of years, four years at least. And the crazy part, and, and it's literally because of that, as I was able to actually get a job, thank God. But the, the idea here is that I didn't really plan to get into marketing and to get a full-time job into marketing. As a matter of fact, I actually majored in finance, right? I didn't even major in marketing. I majored in finance. And the irony is I don't even use my finance degree. Literally, I don't use it. Like, I've never gotten a job with a finance degree. I just show my portfolio and the stuff that I've actually done and the experience, and then that's it. That's the crazy part. The idea here is that the stuff... So it's it's interesting because the case with Sunny, what happened with the company of Sunny, which is how PlayStation was never a main focus for them. They didn't... Sunny didn't say, hey, let, how can we get into the gaming industry? How can we completely dominate the gaming industry? Uh, let's go out and create our own... Con That's not how it happened, right? It just happened sort of by accident. Like it was just a side project that they were doing. And which ended up becoming actually extremely profitable. And then that all of a sudden became one of their main sources of revenue. It, it, it brought in one third of their revenue, like I said earlier. And it's funny because the exact same, you could say, pattern I had to go through. And I tell you not now, I shit you not, I did not actually plan, like, specifically to actually get into marketing like that. No. I was actually planning to, um, what was I planning to do? I was planning to get into coding, actually. Yeah, yeah, because I remember at the time I was, uh, like, learning how to use Python and fucking HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and all that. I built, like, a website. Even built a website for my music. <laughs> for that as well, right? So I, I picked up those skills. I learned coding and all that and shit. I even coded for a hotel. Oh, yeah, that's another one of the jobs that I worked. Actually, that was a job that I worked the day after I graduated. I got a job in a hotel and I actually had to find that job. The crazy, the story behind how I got, I found that job was crazy. I ended up working, um, uh, I ended up building a website for them actually. Yeah. For the restaurant specifically. And then like the whole QR code integration thing where people can just scan and then the menu pops up and all that stuff. So I did that. And I was still early in coding. Like I was coding at least, it wasn't even a year. It was like six to nine months of coding. And honestly, coding was fucking boring. I hated it. I don't like it. I mean, I don't hate it. I like the idea of building a project, but like just sitting and writing lines of code, it's not like, I, I personally don't like it. The only reason I even got motivated was because of the idea of making money. And right? it was more so, it was more so motivated by greed than anything else. But if I had, like, if if you'd ask me would I do coding for free, hell no. I wouldn't even think about it. I wouldn't even consider it. I don't give a shit <laughs> at all, right? But stuff like marketing, I was doing as, like, a means to an end. And I enjoy it. I mean, I could do it for free, and it's interesting. But, like, really, at least 50% of it was more of a means to an end for me, right? It wasn't, like, this is the thing that I'll, this is what I'm going to get. No, that that sort of... Uh, you could say direct, straightforward focus was more uh, directed towards other activities. But hey, I ended up getting a job in marketing and I actually ended up getting experience in it. And it, yeah. And now the hotel thing didn't actually work out. Uh, eventually, you should like that flop. But again, that's another crazy story for another time. The point is, again, the point I'm, I'm saying this because I'm saying all of this is to highlight the pattern, to highlight the lesson, the point which is sometimes the things that are on the side that you have in your periphery, right? That you, they, things change and it transforms and it ends up being the main thing that you focus on, which is really, really interesting to say the least, right? It's really interesting to say the least. Um, but yeah, so I guess the lesson you be drawn from for you is to just experiment be like, like, like always, like, don't ever be satisfied with a specific skill set. Like, experiment, try new things, extend beyond your current capabilities, and try other stuff. Right? You're not sure what will work out. Now, of course, I still have a long way to go in terms of uh, success, but 
I just had to share this because I thought it was really interesting to like to to read that case study of a big multi million billion dollar co corporate company to see that the same sort of rules apply to individuals as these major corporations. That made me pretty damn sure. And given my like like my own experiences and stuff, I knew for a fact that this is probably something that's gonna apply to a bunch of other people, and they're gonna find you guys are gonna find it useful as well, right? So yeah, that's what I have to say. Anyways, guys, peace out.